Welcome to session four, the making of the elephant cage. Uh, the last elephant cage uh, documents the history of the FLIR 9 antenna located in Anchorage, Alaska, and its 50 years of service to the NSA mission. During the session, attendees will hear from the producer, Ms. Erica Richards, and watch the documentary. Questions may be submitted anytime during the presentations through the Q&A uh, chat area. Um, and submitted questions will be gathered and relayed to the speakers by the moder moderator, that's me, uh, Jesse Garrett Harsh, um, at the end of the session. Uh, and so I'm going to send it over. Um, welcome, Erica Richards. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to join this session today. Thank you for attending this session today. Um, like Jesse said, uh, my name is Erica Richards. I am a former video producer at the agency. I say former because I, uh, about a year ago, left the video center to um, take a new opportunity outside of my comfort zone in the cybersecurity directorate. Um, but I was with the video team for six years. Um, I have two degrees in uh, video production and film, a bachelor's and a master's. Um, I never would have thought I would have ended up at the agency doing that. Um, I worked in video or I worked in um, news broadcasting uh, prior to coming to the agency. Um, so today we're going to present to you uh, the last elephant cage documentary. Uh, this is the unclassified version, of course. Um, there is a much longer uh, classified version that exists um, on the inside. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background information, um, this documentary has won a couple awards. Um, it won the best documentary at the IC Awards, which we refer to um, in the in media in the intelligence community um as our internal like mini oscars if you will so it's a chance for all of the uh media teams and all of the ic to submit their work and then um have it peer reviewed and voted on so um really proud of that one uh it winning best documentary and then also uh the Na national cryptologic school now um ncu national cryptologic university um created an award for this uh, through the Learning Excellence Award, um, which was a huge honor. Uh, the commandant of the school at the time had uh, gone to the premiere of this and um, took it upon herself to create a whole award for it. So that was um, a true honor. And um, it's part, and it might sound weird to say it's part of the school, um, but this video is now a mandatory part of the um, training curriculum at the Goodfellow Air Force Base. So that's just some like upfront things that I'm really proud of, about uh, with this video. But I'm going to go all the way back um, at the beginning and explain how we got here today. Um, so the video request for this came to us at the video center from the INL chief at the time, um, Mr. John Taflin. Uh, that some of you might know that name. So obviously we work with the INL a lot. Um, work with all of the organizations at the agency a lot. So he contacted us and he said, guys, I have this antenna out in Alaska. It's been decommissioned and we need to tear it down eventually. So uh, we need some footage of it. So, you know, we, we take on this project, it comes to us and I took it upon myself to start doing some research on this antenna. And once I started really looking at it, I thought there's definitely a story here. There's a story here and it's bigger than what we think it is and it needs to be told, right? So this is bigger than just getting footage, right? There's history here, there's a story, so um, we need to preserve that and tell it. So I went to my chief at the time and I said, you gotta let me do this. Like, I'm really interested in this. I've been reading up on it. I've been searching things on the high and the low side and I, I really wanna do this. Um, and of course, it was a trip to Alaska, which um, I thought would be really exciting. So um, when we started to actually plan out uh, the trip and the project, after realizing how big the elephant cage is, the Flare 9 antenna, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, which well, you'll see in the video, but it's, it's huge, it's ginormous. And I knew there was no real way we were going to capture the scale and scope of just the size of the antenna itself without 
using a drone, right? Like how else are we gonna get this footage? So of course, the video center, we don't have a drone, right? So, um, but I had known of another organization at the agency that does have a drone. So I reached out to them. I didn't have to twist many arms, luckily. They were really um, open to collaborating with us and letting us take the drone all the way to Alaska. And um, we were able to get the footage we need we needed to tell this story um and i always say you know a video is visual right a lot of our stories at the agency are hard to tell without video a lot of the stuff we do um is is hard to make visual so i really wanted to capture that with this one um and pun intended it completely elevated our production uh it just took it to a whole a whole new level um it was also pretty challenging coordinating with an Air Force base, uh, fly, being able to fly a drone there. Um, they were wonderful to work with. We worked with a lot of civilian and military uh, people at, in Alaska, and, and it was just, it was wonderful. And it, it was really what was able to show the, not only the historical impact of this antenna and what it's done for our technology now, but to be able to show the real size and scale of the actual antenna. Um, so that's what this video is about. It's the story and the history behind the Flare 9 antenna um, and the mission and the people that supported it. Um, I also wouldn't, this, this video and this documentary would not be what it is without the participation of all the people that, that agreed to get in front of a camera and talk to me. Um, believe it or not, that's, that's not an easy thing to, to uh, get done at the agency. People are shy and introverted and, um, and it was, it was, you know, it was really interesting how many people came out of the woodwork to talk to me about this. Following on that is, it's interesting, I never would have thought this video would have been received the way it has been received. Um, this was like my baby and I worked on it for so long and I remember sitting with my editor who was also my cameraman and saying like, are people even going to want to watch this? Are people even going to care about this? And it, it really snowballed into something that I could never imagine. I never thought years later I'd still be sitting here um, talking about it and presenting it. But um, I think that just goes to show how important it is to, again, preserve our history and tell our stories. And the best way to do that is uh, through telling stories. So I couldn't have done it alone. Um, and also the effort to get it to an unclassified version so we could share it with the world. Um, it was really, really a big deal. Um, so... Again, I, I just want to thank especially the people at um, the Center for Cryptologic History for keeping this alive, um, all the people that were on the crew, all the people that I interviewed, um, people I tracked down to get more information about things. And um, yeah, I just am happy to be here and happy to present it. And I will do my best, my very best to answer all the questions that I can um, after you watch the documentary. So please enjoy.
elephants. So it looked like a cage, and that was the biggest land animal they could think that you'd put in such a cage. So that's that's where the elephant cage came from. The first time I saw the elephant cage, um, yeah, it, it's very impressive. It's almost breathtaking. Now with I mean, it's this, this monstrosity. I wanted to walk in it. Because it just dwarfs the building. It's so big. It's just, it's huge. Well, I couldn't believe the size of it. It's, it really is a, a huge antenna. And to look at it, you're like, who thought of this? You know, how did they ever think of something like this? If you look the way it's built, is that there are three concentric rings, there's a building in the middle, and you have these big towers. It looks like a big cage. Well, what could you conceivably put in a cage that large? Well, elephants. So it looked like a cage, and that was the biggest land animal I could think that you'd put in such a cage. So that's that's where the elephant cage came from. The first time I saw the elephant cage, um, yeah, it, it's very impressive. It's almost breathtaking. Now with AMOC, it's kind of neat because um, at some of the other ones that I've seen, they were a little further away from the actual operations building. But at AMOC, you're right on top of the elephant cage. So I found that to be really neat where I'm like, oh my God, we're sitting in a classroom on the second floor and it's like right out your window and you're looking, you're like right on top of this thing. I think it's just something that it's hard to describe until you see it, that you can believe the size of it. And then knowing like, okay, I'm interfacing with that to do my mission. It is an amazing piece of architecture here. It's on over 40 acres and it's over 120 feet tall. The pylons themselves go underground for about 30 feet because the FLIR 9 is made primarily out of wood and out of copper, which you would never guess because when you look at it, it looks like it's metal, but it's not. That's what I found to be quite extraordinary is that you could create something so amazing with wood and copper. When you're in tech school and you're learning to be a Morrisop and stuff, you know, one of the things they talk about is the antennas you use and stuff. So they, they talk about, oh, you, you know, if you go to one of the sites with the Flare 9, you know, it's the best antenna in the world. The Flare 9 was our meat and potatoes. It was our sole collection source here in Alaska. So the use of the FLIR 9, it was part of a worldwide network of HF collection systems. It's multiple rings of antennas, really. It's more than just one antenna. So it's designed to collect HF signals and create lines of bearing. It's based on a, a German design from the 1930s. The FLIR 9 antenna can actually track its lineage back to CDAA, which is what it is. Uh, the CDAA was developed during World War II by a team of German scientists led by Dr. Hans Rindfleisch. The doctor led this team to uh, develop this effort for direction finding for the Nazis in the war. These systems were actually uh, also known under a project named Vollenweber. Vollenweber was actually the perfect cover name because it has absolutely nothing to do with the antenna itself. Germans would deploy this system once they developed it. Uh, operationally, their first deployment would be in occupied Denmark. As the U.S. and the Allies uh, proceeded through Europe and began to take back occupied Europe, uh, the Nazis would destroy these systems. In Denmark, they obviously did not destroy completely one of the systems. 
and ultimately when the British sent a lieutenant over after the war to uh, scour Europe looking for parts on these systems because they have an interest in what was this system about, what did it do. Uh, they wanted to exploit that and replicate it. This, uh, this lieutenant goes to Denmark and in Denmark he happens to find a goniometer. Goniometer being the heart literally and figuratively of the CDAA system. So the British share the goniometer with the US and come 1956, we're at the building up of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. A lot of concern about nuclear attack, uh, nuclear surprise attack uh, from bombers, from submarines. So the US decides they're going to take the goniometer and do their own uh, work, our own work with it, and try to develop our own system. The Naval Research Lab is given the goniometer and given the task of developing an operational system that can be put worldwide. So when they built the original Flare 9 family, they deployed those in the early 60s. At the time they built these, HF was the primary means of military communications. In other words, you had, didn't have satellites much, didn't have cell phones. So that was the main mode of communications. So when they built the antennas, you want to be able to hear the signals from, from very distant locations, but you want to accurately DF, do direction finding. And, and the bigger the antenna gets, the more accurate you can get uh, effects on the target and determine where it's transmitting from. HF is very unique as far as the way it propagates. So the, the targets are sending their signals up into the ionosphere and they're refracting back. So we would use the Flare 9 to try to capture those signals going up or coming back down. And we've had success in some of the collection that we did all over the world literally hearing targets from thousands and thousands of miles away. We could hear stuff all the way to South America, Africa, Europe, uh, Asia, all over the place. The Flare 9 up at AMOC was primarily, of course, used during the Cold War to try to track a lot of those targets. Back in, you know, in the Cold War, you wanted to show your presence, you know, and show Russia that, hey, so the, the Russians know that antenna's here. And the Russians actually have a couple, what they call CDAA, which is a circular disposed antenna array, right? So it's basically the same as the Flare 9. So they know what it does. They know the capabilities of it. So the fact that they knew it was here and what the capabilities of, of the antenna are, you know, made that presence known to them that we're listening to you. We were tracking the Russian radar stations they would send in Morse code, and they actually still do this. They're called Russian air defense nets. So these radars would uh, track aircraft as they came into their area of responsibility. And then they would pass Morse code, and we would use that Flare 9 in a receiver to be able to capture that data as that HF energy was being sent up into the ionosphere. We would collect the Russian air defense, and it, it would be Morse, and it would be going sometimes up to two, three characters a second. So you really had to concentrate hard. It almost became, well, it was a second language. You never forget it. So I still know Morse code to this day. They came in the military in 1986, and they told me, what are you going into Morse for? They're going away with that. And it's still alive and kicking, so. <laughs> Who uses Morse code? That's like, a hundred years ago, no one uses that anymore, but I quickly found out it's gonna be around for a long time. That's like any technology today. Like for instance, kids that aren't taught penmanship. Okay, well, what do their signatures look like? It's sort of like the same thing. We've got to maintain that historical perspective because if we don't and they resort back to it, we're gonna be lost. That's why we still have Morse operators that sit in this building. The criticality of the HF Morse code mission and you know how we're transitioning that to our civilian workforce. We have a number of military personnel and that's been a military skill for, for years. Since we are the only U.S. location still doing Morse code, the military has decided that you know it's not worth maintaining that skill. So we've been in the process of civilianizing that with Air Force civilians and we've been allocated a number of billets to transition that. The challenge is, is Morse code. We will end up being the sole trainers and proprietors of HF Morse code. Again, the criticality of that aspect of it is, is they still use it so we still have to maintain a capability and become self-sufficient in both the training and operational use of it.
the only type of collection we really had was from airborne reconnaissance aircraft like EP-3s and RC-135s, the U-2 as well as the SR-71. So that was our first objective, was tactical reporting on those aircraft. They would go in and see how far they could get in or close to Russia and what type of reaction or the USSR would have to our aircraft being in these certain areas as we were trying to monitor their activities. Well, when they would scramble MiGs or other types of, of fighters, these radar stations would track that. And within the air defense, there would be codes that we were able to break to know what those radar stations were saying. And if those MiG fighters got close enough to our aircraft, we would report back to our aircraft and say, hey, you got MiGs within 30 nautical miles of you and they're off to the north. So we would sit and track these things for hours and hours and days and days. So you would kind of go home and you'd just be mentally exhausted from copying Morse code from for almost eight straight hours some days. It was literally when it was busy and there was exercises going on where you had to kind of unplug your headsets and somebody else plugged in their headset so you could go to the bathroom and then come back and start copying again. I remember sitting down that night and the target started going. The next thing I know, somebody's tapping me on the shoulder. It's like, hey, it's time to go home. And you didn't want to go home. Here you are like a 20 some year old person never being out of the United States before. And you're sitting out here tracking these MiGs. It was very, very exhilarating and, and exciting. So I think that Flare 9 really was our baseline to really gave us an opportunity to learn about our targets and, and understand our targets, which led to engineers being able to build us this technology and maybe even taking some of the lessons that we learned from, from years ago off of the Flare 9 and incorporate that into new technology or be able to make antennas that are smaller. The one here at Elmendorf, the reason it's probably the last one in existence is the maintenance on it was better than just about any other site. So our Flare 9 people here did a fantastic job of upkeeping it. But it's also easier because it's on U.S. soil, so that made a big difference too. We've seen kind of all this unfold over the last 15 or 20 years, and now we're at a point where the operators that work for me now sit on what looks like almost like a PC, and, and then the computer kind of does the rest of it. Definitely sad to see the Flare 9 go away, but it was sad to see some of these other things go away too. Because I think it gave the worker or the operator a more sense of what they were doing and it was more work, I guess you could say. Like, you were doing this work instead of the computer doing this work. So I've been trying to really, and my team, try to really get out of um, that there's much you know, for the operators that it's not a green and red light scenario. That is part of it, but what does it mean when that green light is on? What's going on when that green light is processing data? You know, so just trying to teach them what is going on behind the scenes. I guess I'd just like people to understand it always hasn't been like this. Thousands of people have put their heart and soul into getting where we are today. And we've learned so much from this Flare 9 antenna. So I'd like to keep mentioning it to people as long as I'm around, that even though we may not use it today, it has extreme benefits. We wouldn't be doing what we are today without having been given the opportunity to use the Flare 9. Here at the AMOC, even without the Flare 9, without the elephant cage, we're gonna continue doing our absolute best when it comes to strategic aviation. We'll continue to excel, we'll continue to look for new technology, will continue to find other ways to collect the data we need to ensure that we always protect the homeland.
So Erica, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the first one, I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer, but uh, I'll throw <laughs> it out there anyway. Um, Rachel asks, um, can you uh, tell us the other NSA organization that you got the drone from? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I can disclose that, so okay. I'm going to choose to not. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Peter asked, um, were these, um, he said, weren't these receiving antennas? The graphics in the video seem to show them as broadcasting. Yeah, no, these are, these are receiving antennas. Um, I think the graphic was trying to show that um, things were being transmitted and we were receiving it. So hopefully that was um, done correctly, if that makes sense. Um, nothing was ever sent out from from the elephant cage antennas from the flare nine antennas so um hopefully the graphic the animations uh if you maybe go back and watch go back to youtube and watch um maybe it will look different um and this isn't a question just a comment from bill he said Wow, amazing what's been declassified since my service in the 1980s and the 1990s. Yeah, I agree. I, w I really was not sure if I was going to ever be able to get this to an unclassified version. It went through so many reviews, so many iterations. Um, we really, really did our due diligence. We had multiple CA reviews um, and uh, a pre-pub review. So to, to be honest, I can't believe it's out there. Like I did not think it was going to happen, but I was really determined. Um, like I said, I worked with a lot of people to get this to this level. Um, so I promise it's unclassified. <laughs> <laughs> um, this question's coming from me, but um, when the new or when the museum reopens, the National Cryptologic Museum, um, will this be available? Because this seems like yeah. a great thing to include. Yeah, I'm hoping it will be. Um, I know when we were working with the folks in Alaska and um, and you know back at NSAW, um, the goniometer, which you saw in the video, um, one of them from Alaska is being sent back, or it already is um, at the archives, I think. Um, so I'm hoping this can be shown at the museum, maybe with the goniometer on display or something. So um, fingers crossed, um, I'm gonna contact the museum again and just see just see if that's a possibility. So hopefully, yes. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so unless someone has a last question, um, I'll just uh, thank you, Erica, for being here with us. Um, I really enjoyed it and I, I hope our attendees did. Um, and let everyone know that in about 15 minutes, we'll be starting session five, um, Cryptology in, in France. So thank you very much. Thank you.